Hey everyone, welcome back to the 4 Northwest Workshop. I'm Matthew, and today we're doing another unboxing and review of a tool that I don't know how I've made it this long without having here in my workshop. The 14 inch standalone woodworking bandsaw from Harbor Freight. Now I know what you're thinking, and uh, that's probably why you found this video. Is it worth the time, and especially your money, to get one there, or to hold out for a little longer, save up your money, and get one from Delta? Well, let me let you in on a little secret. <clears throat> it's a Delta knockoff. And that's probably a good thing. If you were going to uh, make your own tool, you would probably want to choose a reputable brand that has stood the test of time and copycat it. Make your own and base it on their designs. And uh, from everything that I've read, and I'm gonna guess that before finding this video, you've also read a lot of reviews. They've done a good job. But before you go spending that money, I've already done that for you. I've brought it in here. And from beginning to end, we're going to unbox it, lay it all out on the table, put it all together, and give it its first test run. And then you can decide whether or not it's worth your money to get one there or hold out for something better. Don't go nuts. Stick around. And let's find out. Together! All right, now when you go and pick this thing up over at Harbor Freight and uh, you're walking through there and you see it standing there in all of its bright green gleaming glory, well, uh, it doesn't look like that when you buy it. There's gonna be a tag, you're gonna take it up front and uh, you're gonna hand it to one of the cashiers. They're gonna make a little call on their walkie-talkie to somebody in the back and tell you you made a good choice and you might wanna back up your car because this thing is heavy and the box isn't small. So I hope your trunk is big or you brought a truck. And uh, then they'll proceed to strap their spine protectors on and give you a hand loading it up. Here it is, this is what it looks like. recommend nor do myself lift this thing alone but uh, there's nobody here and uh, well I don't care so I'm going to all right well that is that is a lot more than not heavy I'll tell you that right now but uh, I mean, look at the, the construction looks and the construction looks great solid cast a uh, lot of a uh, lot of sheet metal parts. Uh, the sheet metal housing that'll hide the uh, wheels and tires. Let's take a look at that noise. Let's see what's going on inside here. We're gonna have to take those off, anyways. Let's have a look inside. I guess I could read the manual. It did come with one. That's probably a good idea. You know, probably give me a couple of hints on how to put this thing together. I'm sure you all want to watch me read the manual. Front to back in all the languages. All right, I'm not doing that. I mean, the best I can figure, you know, all the parts, they only have one place it could possibly go, right?
And this is where that bag of bolts comes in. That's gonna be this action here, which I can only, I can only assume is gonna be that handful that you saw me set out a little bit ago, where there's a ton of these. Little short carriage style bolts with the washer and nuts already screwed on. Maybe the bag that you got on your kit came like that, maybe they didn't. All right, by now we should have the base all put together and it should look something like this. It should look a lot like this. It, it should be exactly like this. The front designated by, not just a sticker, but a milled hole for your switch. The top plate will have a large hole towards the back of the unit. This is where the belt pulley system will be going through to the motor. The motor below will be mounted to this motor mounting plate. Motor mounting plate should be more or less on the switch side of this little cabinet here. So let's go ahead and put the saw body on top of the base and see how the holes line up. I've heard horror stories in the past of uh, holes not lining up and having to uh, drill out some of the sheet metal to make things fit. So far everything's fit exactly where it should and I'm gonna guess like most things with consumer products 90% of the time it's operator error and the tools are just fine But who the hell am I? You might want to get a hand with this. It's not light Oh, come on This is not happening. The holes, they line up. <sighs> well, I guess it's uh, best we go ahead and hard mount it to the base then. Here I was looking forward to drilling holes in sheet metal. All right, according to our handy dandy set of plans here, the next step is connecting the feet to our base using these. Now, lucky for me, my nut sack already included these put together. Uh, uh. Through the top of the feet, you're going to have your bolt against a flat washer. Through the bottom, you're going to have your nut against a lock washer against another flat washer. Let's do that yesterday. <laughs> you thought I was going to say now. Now we're gonna get the heart of this thing transplanted into the motor mounting plate below our stand here. Now make sure that that heavy ass box included your three quarter horsepower motor. 
Now, it should have included, mounted onto the motor already, the corresponding nuts, washers, and bolts, and what have you, that you're going to need to mount to your plate here. Uh, if they're not on there, we'll check one of your nut sacks. Be sure that when you mount this to the plate, that you're mounting it on the other side. If you mount it on backwards, it'll probably unmake the universe. Let's get going. All right. Now I've gone ahead and swung the camera around to the other side of our base so you can see what's going on. The plan suggests that you get an extra set of hands to hold up the motor while you mount all the mounting hardware to the motor mounting plate. I don't have an extra set of hands because I'm just a human. So I've done the next best thing and pulled the genius move of using a couple of wood blocks that I have sitting around the shop. That's going to hold my motor up in high enough position that I can get those nuts, bolts, and washers mounted through the plates of the motor through the motor mounting bracket underneath the base. Say that once fast. It's impossible. Now, the motor mounting bracket requires these bolts have the large washer on this side of our mounting plate. On the other side, flat washer, lock washer, and our nut. If you're looking at the front of the machine, the motor is on the left side of the mounting plate, which would put your gearing right below the giant hole for the belt pulley action. All right, we're hanging in there. We got before us an ever shrinking pile of parts, which means we're nearing the end of our bandsaw assembly. Right on, right on. We have the belts. Should be two of them in your package. They gave us a little bandsaw to get us going. We have the base plate. This is where the bandsaw will be going through. Uh, the middle uh, right there. They gave us a little uh, a clearance guide. Uh, it's made out of plastic and you know down the road I'll probably show you how to make one out of hardwood for a, a zero clearance uh, guide for the center of that base plate. We have the side covers to the base. We have the miter uh, sled gauge noise. We got some guides for that bandsaw they included. We have a piece of metal with a bolt and nut through it. I don't know what that is. We have a cover door. That will go over the uh, belt pulleys on the top of the base uh, as access when you need to change the speeds, which there's four for this unit. We got the uh, power switch and the power cord. The booklet suggests that we do that part next. So let's go. Alrighty, time to get our on off switch installed into our cabinet. The baggie will include a couple of these plastic clips. These will clip to the wires and snap into the back of our on off switch box that will prevent those cables from being yanked out of the switch. That baggie should include this little metal clip. This little metal clip will secure our power cable to the inside of the cabinet here. There are two holes next to this on off mill out hole here on the side of the leg. The power cable will slip in through the side for these to reach our power box. This little clip will be screwed on the inside through a smaller hole through which this cable was slipped. It'll hold this cable securely to the inside of the leg and prevent the power cable from being yanked away from the box also. So, put the box behind the housing and pass your cord through the bottom of your box from the inside of the housing. Okay. While you got that in there, so the cord is going to be going through the box, the box behind the housing, you know, where it makes sense. While you got that cable in there, go ahead and pass your green cord through that little side hole. That way your green cable can be mounted on the inside of the cabinet to the grounding screw. Now you're going to bring that cable over from your motor. That'll go into the top of the box from the inside of the housing. Once again, while you're in there, 
and pass your green cable through that same little side hole. Now both green cables should be going through the side of that plastic box to mount to your grounding screw on the housing. And these can now start to be positioned where they should have been in the bloody first place, like so. Now, so let's start with the power cable. The power cable, which should be the one you pass through the bottom of the plastic box, will be mounted to the bottom two prongs on the back of your power switch. Black on the bottom left from your power cable. White on the bottom right from your power cable. Now, on the top two prongs, these are the wires that go to the motor. Make sure on the back of your housing that that is the proper set of black and white wires coming from the cable going to your motor. And we're going to match sides. Top right will be the white. Top left be the black. These go to the motor. So your power now is to the switch. Once you switch it on, you're allowing power to go to the motor. Be sure that the two green wires from both the power cable and the motor cable are coming out of that little plastic box on the inside of your housing so that they can be screwed to this hole for your grounding. Now that we've done that, we can push these inside our box. Very nice. Now we'll go on the inside. And get those green grounding wires from the box and the two wires, your motor wire and your power wire, crimped to this. Hopefully you hung on to your little lock washer, flat washer, and the nut. There you see them right there. Look at that. All right. So there's the view of our two grounding wires. And these are going to hook on, hopefully, without too much of a challenge, onto our grounding screw for the housing. Alrighty. The instructions now suggest that we go ahead and take our pulley sheave block and mount it onto the body. This will be going directly below our main drive wheel in that slot here. We'll be taking the front cover off of the saw body and it will be mounted using these two large nuts and these two washers, also large. Let's do that. That's what it should look like. So the motor drive pulley has four positions that can be connected to the outermost position down to the second to the last position. This last position right here, and you'll notice this if you read your manual, this position here is for the direct belt that goes to the main drive to move our band, the band saw band. So you will not be putting a belt from the motor here, only on these outermost rings. This is only for the belt to our main drive. Now your package should have included two belts, a long one and a short one. I'll give you which Guess which, where this one goes. Somebody's here, let's go see. Hello? Hello, 
cookie. Hi, bug. Cookie. What's wrong? Cookie. Mommy took your cookie. Yeah. Oh, well, come over here and give me a hug. Did you have fun at the park? Yeah. You had fun at the park? Yeah. Do you want to wipe your nose on my sleeve? No. Yes, you do. Go like this. Here. Oh. Yes. Okay. What was I blathering about? Pulleys. Belt. Belts. Pulley belts. Good Lord. A long one and a short one. The short one will link from this last pulley here to our drive pulley for the band saw. Long one? Yep. You guys are smart. You got it. From here to the motor. Now the motor you can see is still a little too low. We got plenty of adjustment on the mounting plate to the motor to raise that thing up. So I'm going to put another block under there raise this thing up and mount it on the outside wheel. This will be the slowest position on the, uh, on the pulleys. As you go down in size, that's what you'll be looking at here when you open up the box. That's what this thing's all about. When you open that up to uh, make some adjustments for your speed, uh, the outside is the slowest speed and progressively gets faster the further in you move your belt. When you move your belt, of course, you're going to have to move the belt down below to the corresponding wheel down here. These wheels will get bigger, these wheels will get smaller, and your speed will increase. All right, so I went inside, took a little break, and I did a little research about the whole uh, woodcutting bandsaw speed thing. And from everything that I've researched, there really isn't going to be a case where I'm going to need to reduce the speed drastically to its lowest speed, which is the largest wheel to the smallest wheel on the motor. Uh, those speeds are at 568 feet per minute on this unit. Uh, speeds that slow are going to be for cutting metals. Uh, normally on a bandsaw like this, the only types of metals you're going to want to put to this uh, type of bandsaw would be non-ferrous uh, metals that a magnet won't stick to. So soft metals like copper, aluminum, uh, brass, <clears throat> and light gauges also, thin. Uh, you would put on a different uh, type of bandsaw blade and you would reduce your speeds. But if you primarily are going to be using this for soft and hard woods, like I am, uh, we're going to go ahead and leave this belt on the highest uh, speed position, uh, position four, which would be the smallest wheel at the uh, head and the largest wheel on the motor. Other than that, just Google it. All right, onto the table assembly. Now remember that piece of metal I told you I didn't know what it was for? I know what it's for now. It goes on the bandsaw. I knew it was for something. Now, if you actually read through all these instead of just watching me do it and following my instruction, it tells you to use uh, this bolt and a lock washer. Well, when you look at the holes in here, man, that is an awfully large hole to have just a lock washer in. Well, we have these extra flat washers also that perfectly fit these bolts and would seat much better on there. Well, in the very back of your booklet, you're going to notice a full-blown diagram. And when you look at that part there, it shows that bolt and that lock washer. Well, I'll be damned if it doesn't also show that flat washer I just put on there. Very useful. Why they didn't include that in the actual instruction, who cares? We figured it out. So let's put it on. Now this piece here has got these two curved 
bracket spacings here that the uh, adjustable table will be mounting into. And we'll get to that in a moment. But these are going to be facing up, like so. It's got two holes that will be going into these two. You'll notice the milling has two threaded holes across from each, not directly across from each other, but diagonally across from each other on this square plate. And that's what we're going to be mounting to. All right, next we're going to be putting on the first guide roller, which is this little bad boy here. Well, that's what it looks like anyways, so I'm going to take a wild guess. Now, there was two other bolts and two other washers that I told you that I didn't know what they were for. Well, I know what they're for now. Let's get it on. Now after having put these on here, I wanted to see if it was uh, telling me to secure these now, which I'm only hand tightening them. It was after I did that that I looked at the instruction. It actually said right here, note, the hardware for this step is packaged separately from the other hardware nut bags. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were. Uh, I don't know if you remember at the beginning of the video, there was a couple things that were uh, left out of that uh, sack of nuts and bolts and washers. And these were two of them. These were left out, and so were these. And with good reason. These probably would have been easy to mix up, though they really are threaded only to fit in one place on this machine. So, either way, you would have figured it out, right? Now when you mount the table onto the machine, these slots right here are designed to hold the trunnions. These are the trunnion racks. And they have holes inside where the trunnion pins, or for our adjustment knobs, are going to slide through on either side. Those trunnions are what allows us to pivot our table for specialty cuts. Now we can go ahead and slip our knobs, our lock knobs, onto those trunnion pins. Right on, right on. So, our miter slot will be to the outside of the machine. And that's how you know you've had this set in the right position on the power head. Another indication that you have the table mounted in the right position is this little miter gauge that is taped to the trunnion. You'll also notice that it has a little reference pin here. This is likely set at the factory so we're gonna leave it alone for now. Uh, I'd imagine that it's probably in its right position but you never know and that's why there's a Phillips head on there to make any kind of minute adjustments to break this thing to zero once we have everything set up and tightened. Put on the top guide now. This post is going to be going through this housing on the back of the bandsaw body and uh, I'm going to grab a wrench that will fit this thing because uh, none of the ones I have out here do. So give me a moment. Oh, oh first try. That's a 10 millimeter. That's what I'm using on this here. Okay. Drop it down through the top. Let's see, do they include anything with it? I'm gonna guess that this takes, I'm gonna guess that this takes a knob. That's what the picture looks like anyways. See that little black arrow and the tip is missing? The reason is the top of this cover here is gonna slip behind. The wheel cover. So there you go. I'm going to have this 
flush with the bottom of this bracket here. The post will be flush with the bottom of this bracket. The reason being is it can only go through so far before it hits the back of the post of the bearing guide. If you try to go all the way through, it'll, it'll hit your bearing guide. Now remember, these are cast parts, so anything that has a machined bolt going through it, through these cast parts, there's no reason to over tighten it. Snug should be good enough. If something comes loose, you can snug it again. But don't over tighten it in these cast parts, you'll strip threads, or worst case scenario, you'll break a cast part, and then you are SOL. All right. So if your uh, package was outfitted correctly, it should have included your uh, pulley, belt, cover, and door, like you see here. They should have also included the mounting hardware, which is going to be these four nuts, sets of two washers on each, and the screw. We're going to go ahead and mount that now. Now that we got those all popped in there after I spent a good uh, 10 minutes looking for the pieces that I dropped, here's a nifty little tool right here. That'll help me hold on to the nuts and tighten these up. My goodness, have we come so far? It's time to put in the blade. Now, I'm accident prone, so when you uh, unravel these blades, they have a tendency to kind of spring open on you and, and just, you know, they, they jump out and bite you and chase you around the front yard. So it's, uh, you know, it's recommended that you get a pair of gloves on because these teeth are very sharp. Uh, 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 All right, there. Good Lord. All right. <clears throat> so when we uh, insert this blade, we got to take out this uh, table uh, pin, uh, the guard, not the guard, but the uh, insert should be removed also. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. threaded in there and it's just it's just popped in there and it's got it has some scoring on the end there I don't know if that's just from the initial insert or if that's just to hold it in there but it's tight all right now you're also going to need to remove the blade guard on the left side now when you insert your blade you want to have the back of the blade, not the two side, but the back of the blade, the flat of the blade, going through the split in the table. Once you get to the hole, you'll be able to spin the blade around and hopefully not mar it up before you've even used it. I put these on just so I wouldn't lose them. That holds the, uh, the wheel housing cover. You're going to slip your blade over the wheel behind the blade guide guard and in between your guide blocks. You can then do the same in the bottom. There's guide blocks at the bottom. You're going to slip it between those and over the wheel beneath the table. Once you've gotten this far, we can go ahead and tighten up this wheel to try to pull some of the slack out of the blade. 
the wheel tension is the big knob on the top back. Now when you get it, there's a chance that it might be tighter than when I received mine and you'll need to loosen it a lot to drop the wheel down so that you can easily slip your blade over. In my case, I only needed a few turns to drop the wheel down counterclockwise. Now, right now the blade is still loose enough for me to be able to move around, which is how I want it just for now until I get everything mounted where I need it. Alrighty, now that we've got our blade installed, it's time to set the tension. Now I've already done this part. Do a little due diligence, look up some methods online. Uh, there's quite a few ways from the, uh, from the pluck method so that it sets off just that perfect tone like a guitar string. There's the uh, quarter inch of deflection where you raise this all the way up. And if you can push this uh, a quarter of an inch or less, you're probably good. Um, the, the, the only for sure method is knowing the type of blade that you have, the type of steel blade that you have, and uh, getting a tension meter. Those will run you about the cost of this saw, so probably not worth it. I wouldn't do it. Uh, another method suggests that you, for the most uh, demanding of resawing jobs on this, where you're doing uh, thick material, the uh, hardwood and you have the full height of your guide all the way up for resawing that you're gonna damn near completely compress your tension spring as you see here now this is pretty pretty well depressed here uh, it's not completely compressed but it's pretty damn tight uh, these some of these blades can be in the uh, standard wood blades for these saws can be in the 15,000 to 20,000 uh, PSI uh, tension range which that's a hell of a lot of tension but there should be very little flex in these blades once you get these mounted in and uh, you can see how I mean there's just there's very little uh, play in that blade and some might even say it's not tight enough uh, you're gonna have to figure that out for yourself or uh, what your application is do a little bit of research and you'll you'll get there uh, the next part is adjusting the guides. Now you're gonna leave the table loose so that you can pivot it up to get to the guides below here. Now these guides, I used a uh, 10 millimeter for all these adjustment screws here. This adjustment screw will move this uh, cradle that houses your, uh, your blocks these are the guide blocks that go against the blade. They won't actually touch the blade, but they get very, very close. Uh, the, these will allow you to adjust these in and out on either side. Now, before you do that, you're going to loosen these, and I just push the blade and it pull, pushes the blocks out away from itself. Also, loosen this here, that way you can back the bearing away. Uh, this guide bearing uh, will not allow the blade to deflect backwards as you're pushing your material into the blade. Uh, so have this loosened up so that the bearing guide can move back. Have these loosened up so that your blocks can move away from your blade. You'll move these, you'll loosen these so that you can move the cradle uh, forward. You're only going to move it forward enough till these blocks are on either side of the blade, but the front of the blocks should not be uh, on the cutting surface uh, of the teeth. They shouldn't be passing the surface of these teeth here. Uh, this actually shouldn't allow you with the, the length of the rod for the bearing. Won't allow you to go that far, but uh, if you move it too far forward, you'll start to have these blocks covering some of the cutting surface of the teeth, and that's what you don't want. Just, I, I move it to about the gullets uh, behind the teeth here. After you get it moved that far, you can go ahead and tighten these down. This is still loose. At this point, you can slip your blocks in towards the blade. They're going to be very, very close to the blade. Let's see if I can get you a shot in here. 
There's a lot of things going on in here. Now, yeah, that might be too difficult to see. But the blade is right here, and the blocks are on either side of it. And there's just a very, very minute gap on either side of the blade here between the blade and the blocks. After you get those blocks not touching but close to the blade on either side, you can tighten those down with these two. After that, you can go ahead and slip your bearing, your uh, back bearing, not tight against the back of the blade, but just about touching. That way, when you push material into it, it'll press against this bearing and the bearing will roll with the blade direction and uh, it'll allow for minimal deflection backwards against your blade. You'll move your table back to level or just, you know, get it out of your way. And then you'll adjust here. Pretty much the same as below. Your uh, adjustment screws are going to be this knob for moving the, the block uh, cradle in and out. And this, uh, this bolt here is for the front, the top back bearing guide here. So you'll loosen this one here so you can slide the top back bearing in and out. You'll just go ahead and push that back. You'll loosen these up here and pull your blocks out. Now it's the same as below. You don't want your blocks, the front of your blocks, past your teeth. I just move the front of the block to about where the gullets between each of the teeth are. At that point, I'll lock the cradle down with this knob here. And then I can come over and adjust my blocks to the, uh, to the blade. Now it's very, very close. There's such a small amount of gap there. I could maybe slip a, a, a sheet or two of paper between. Some may like it closer, some may not. You'll have to decide after you start cutting. But once you got it pretty damn close, not quite touching, you can go ahead and tighten these guide blocks down. And just like below, get your guide bearing behind the blade, almost touching the back of your blade. Once you've gotten there, go ahead and tighten that down. At that point, you should have the blade on, the tension set, your guide bearings and blocks in place. And uh, you should be able to move your uh, blade around just by your hand. Uh, you grab the bottom wheel and move it around. And you'll be able to look and see how your blade is tracking on the, uh, on the tire here. It's kind of hard to see because the blade is black and the tire is black. But it should be tracking in the middle of the tire here. You go about five turns, five revolutions of, of these wheels and it'll give you a good idea of how it's tracking. If it starts to move towards the front or the blade starts to move towards the back, that's what this knob is for. It's got a lock nut on there. You'll unlock this and you can uh, screw it in or out to track the blade either to the front of the wheel or to the back of the wheel. You want that riding right in the middle. So loosen that nut in the back, make an adjustment on that knob and get that tracking on the center of the wheel. Once it's tracking center, it only takes maybe a quarter of a turn on that wheel. It takes very little to turn and track this blade in either to the front or to the back. So play around with that knob a little bit till your blade is tracking center. Once it is, hold your knob and lock down that nut and you should be set. Well, we're about there. And it's about time that we go ahead and start putting on covers and get ready to flip this baby on. something and uh, I'll bring it up uh, you know after the fact 
Um, these are the side panels right here. I mean, these are pretty simple. These little clips, tabs, go on the outside of uh, either of the legs. Got these two finger holes to uh, slip them up inside the, uh, the bottom of the base. And then you slip these uh, over the outside of the base uh, sheet metal. And these will kind of hide the housing below. So you can figure that out. That's not a big deal. Uh, what's important is done now. <clears throat> and uh, I think it might be uh, time to uh, turn this thing on and see if we did what we were supposed to do and we did it right. All right. Well, let's move it over to its new location, plug it in, fire it up, and give it a test run. But wait, what about the motor tension on the belt? <sighs> that would have sucked. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and do that now. The tension on the belt from the motor. Yeah, there's these are complicated machines. I mean, you know, they're there's a lot to remember here, and, and uh, you know, I pretty much spent all day shooting this. But, uh, you know, doing it for you, I'm doing it for me, we're doing it together, and we're going to get it done right. So let's go ahead and get the motor uh, pulley belt tensioned up. Because that would have been really dumb. Now, how much tension do we put on that belt? Well, I don't know. It doesn't really tell you. But uh, I'm going to guess enough to make the wheels turn. So uh, if the belts are slipping, not tight enough. If the wheels are turning, oh, I guess that's tight enough. <laughs> Well, that would have been a big mistake. I was about ready to roll it over to its new location, plug it in and fire it up while that motor was sitting on blocks. Boy, I really hope you guys watch this video through and through because, uh, boy, better trial and error on my end and then you guys get it done right the first time, huh? Well, I think it's time. I'm sure I'm forgetting something. <laughs> well, barring being bolted to the floor, it feels really solid. And I think we're ready to put a piece of wood through that blade. Let's do it. All right, bite your nails. It works. Well, there you have it. The 14 inch standalone woodworking bandsaw from Harbor Freight. Now this build went a lot easier than I thought it was going to go. I've read all the horror stories and you probably have too. Uh, and I didn't have that many issues. Granted, it took me two days to shoot this video of putting it together, but realistically, if I didn't have the distraction of making a video for everybody to, you know, get a good look at what this thing is before spending the money on it, I could have done it in a, maybe in an afternoon. But you have to remember, this thing, it comes in a box, it comes in a basket case, and it includes a, a freaking novel on all the different little pieces and, and where they go and, and all the different moving parts and the, and the diagrams and the schematics and, and the you know Delta Force recon groups going out on midnight raids behind enemy territories, trying to help you get this thing put together. 
And let's face it, not everybody is totally mechanically inclined. And that's okay. Because there's people like me, they're maybe put a video together on something that's a little bit more complicated. Yeah, sometimes Craigslist is easier, but you don't know what you're gonna get and you don't know how the thing was treated. At least this way, it's all brand new and if there's something wrong, it was probably your fault. <laughs> but no, seriously, it's, it's a great machine and I think it's gonna do everything that I need it to do. I'm gonna change the blade to a quarter inch so I can do more intricate cutting. I'll set it up with a fence down the road so I can do some resawing. And remember, just like any other tool, there's a lot of different adjustments on this thing to really dial it in for the type of work that you wanna do. And that's what I'm gonna to have to do myself. You'll have some issues with blade tension and uh, some drifting either to the left or to the right. And that's just the nature of a bandsaw. And a lot of your other tools too. If there's something out of calibration, your table saw is not gonna work the way that you want it to. But you're gonna work your way around it because it's one of those staple pieces that you have to have in your shop. And after you get a woodworking bandsaw like this, it'll become one more tool that you don't know how you went so long without having one in your shop. I know I'm at that point now and I'm already having fun. Now, it's time to make some ax handles and get this thing to pay itself off. I hope you enjoyed the video. As always, you can get it done, and I hope I can help. This is the 4R Northwest Workshop. I'm Matthew. Thanks for watching.